Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's a real honor to be here. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me and inviting Qualcomm to uh, talk to you guys about how we see uh, the mobile ecosystem and where we see innovation going. And uh, the structure of this conversation, the way I, I thought we'd do it, is I'll wait for a few of the people to get seated, if you don't mind. Come on in, guys, plenty of seats. So the structure of the conversation here, what I thought I would do is I'll take about 15 minutes or so just to give you a general context of how we see the world and uh, where we see some innovation happening. And then what the real stars of this next 40 minutes are going to be uh, two startup companies I'll introduce. Uh, one is a company called Opal Sig Open Signal, and the second one is a company called Matterport. And those two CEOs will come up and talk about their companies themselves. And I think you'll be blown away uh, by what they're doing themselves. And then we'll come up and wrap up. Um, and if we have time, we'll take questions. Okay? So getting started, uh, just a little bit about Qualcomm. Um, some people know us, some people don't. Um, we're effectively the company that's invisible and behind the mobile ecosystem. Uh, we've been around for about 28 plus years. Uh, we were born mobile. We like to call ourselves born mobile. Uh, we started out in CDMA technologies and then several years ago uh, integrated CDMA and GSM. And we're the world's largest fabulous semiconductor company. Um, if you have a smartphone or a tablet and it has a modem, it probably has ours in it. If, it. if it's a smartphone that has an application processor, most likely it has ours in it. May have a few others in it, uh, but most likely it has ours in it. We're number one in wireless. Um, and it, even though it says largest semiconductor company that is fabulous, I think by market cap we are the largest semiconductor company. And that's just happened very recently. So it's something we're proud of. We're both on the S&P 100 as well as on the Fortune 500. We're extremely excited about the opportunities that mobile represents. There are about 6 billion people on the planet. There are about 6.9 billion connections for uh, mobile and cellular. If you look out over the next four years, between 2013 and 2017, anywhere from five to seven billion smartphones are gonna get sold. So over the course of the next four to five years, the entire globe, every single person, is gonna have the equivalent of a smartphone. That's gonna be incredibly powerful from an uh, enablement standpoint and what people can do with it, and that's what excites us. And to, say, to put that in a little different perspective, if we just look at the shipment rates from a device's standpoint, look at PCs versus mobile plus tablets, and both just raw shipments, you can see here the data between 2012 and 2017, um, the action, the excitement, is very clearly on the mobile side. Now, if you look at it on the right-hand side of the chart, my right-hand side, as well as your right-hand side, you can see from a revenue standpoint, revenue and semiconductor content, a lot of the action, again, is on the mobile and tablet side. What that's driving is effectively, you know, the world is driven largely by economics, and money follows money. And what you're seeing is a lot of VC money is not going into mobile. In 2012, about 41% of all of the money that VCs put into startups, 41% went into companies that were in mobile. And what we are seeing here in terms of the impact that mobile technology can have on lives and people from a healthcare standpoint, education standpoint, work standpoint, we're just at the very, very beginnings of this making a, a, a dent in what people can do with it. So, a couple of examples. Healthcare, uh, this particular example is from the United Kingdom. They had the largest uh, 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 pilot of telehealth, about 6,200 patients that participated in remote health monitoring and huge impact here uh, from a technology standpoint to basically monitor uh, the patient while they're not in the hospital. And about a 45% reduction in mortality. That's a massive number. About a 20% reduction in number of patients coming into the emergency care. And think of that from a standpoint of cost reduction uh, in the healthcare system, and healthcare costs are rising pretty much in every part of the globe. Another example, uh, education. About 70 billion will be spent on mobile education between now and 2020. And the impact of this, again, on kids and their ability to learn is just stunning. Um, 
Several years ago, uh, Negroponte, Nicholas Negroponte from MIT's Media Labs had a program called the One Laptop Per Child, and uh, the goal was to unleash the uh, uh, learning potential for kids. Um, a few years after that program, um, a random uh, researcher dropped off a bunch of tablets at a bunch of villages in Africa. That's it. No instruction manuals, nothing. Just dropped off tablets. Kids in that uh, particular, in the villages where they dropped off tablets, wound up self-teaching themselves um, English alphabet, and they had no prior education in that. So huge impact in terms of the way kids can learn, largely because the medium is very, very easy to get acquainted with and facilitates uh, learning. Third example I want to give is in the corporate environment and in the enterprise. In the enterprise, you're seeing a massive change take place in a whole bunch of areas. First of all is the influx of mobile devices in the form of tablets uh, and in smartphones. Again, just starting, and the amount and the degree to which people are going to be able to use their um, mobile devices to effectively do all of the corporate transactions previously that they did on their PCs, that cusp is just starting and has an impact on the way software is written, defined, and deployed in the enterprise. Software as a service is a key part of the, how those, that software is going to be deployed, and the company annual growth rate for SaaS or software as a service is about 17% in this environment. Now, couple that with the change in the data center, where basically cloud uh, traffic and cloud uh, demand is growing something like 25 to 30% over the next few years consistently. All of those are huge changes. And historically, if you're looking at things that are exciting, the consumer marketplace has been where the excitement has been. And anything in the enterprise is about as exciting as watching paint dry, right? Um, over the next 10 years, the enterprise environment is going to be extraordinarily exciting because there's going to be a lot of disruption taking place there. So circling full circle, I want to just run a short video clip that puts a bunch of these uh, examples in context, and then I will start to turn it over to my first colleague. Oops, before I do that, um, that, that talked about three trends. Um, the last one I want to talk about is the Internet of Everything. And there is expected to be about 25 billion devices that are going to be connected, 25 billion devices that are going to be connected by 2020. Yes, there will be wearables such as watches, glasses, etc. But equally exciting is going to be connecting your home, whether it's through the Nest thermostat that recently got acquired by uh, Google, or whether it's by smart metering, uh, or whether it's your cars getting uh, connected in a significant way, not to watch movies, et cetera, in the car, but effectively to enable uh, faster servicing of key componentry in the cars. All of that will ultimately drive better efficiency and better costs. And the internet of everything is yet to come, and this is a huge growth opportunity. And the technologies that are likely to drive this are going to be mobile technologies. Because every one of these devices is going to have to have a connection, and every one of these devices is going to have to have a very low power, but still high performance compute element. So we believe this is an exciting and target-rich environment for innovation as well. Can you turn the volume up, please, on this?
through the medical center. And uh, if I had a problem with my heart, a doctor from the call center would call me right away. I now have more control over my life. I use that a lot for study. It's a little smaller than the book. We use that to check if each other. You know, I still use it for fun. I think those stories are just the beginning of what's possible and the real excitement in what's possible in mobile with mobile technology is yet to come. If you're a fan of baseball, this is sort of like the first inning out of nine innings. If you're a fan of cricket, it's sort of again the first inning out of the uh, uh, second uh, uh, several day match. So there's a lot of excitement to come and instead of me talking about it, what I'd like to do is um, introduce OpenSignal and Brendan Gill, the CEO. OpenSignal is a fantastic uh, company. They're doing some amazingly innovative stuff. Uh, let's invite up Brendan and he'll talk to you about that and he'll then invite up his colleague. Brendan? Thank you. Take it away. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thank you, Anand. So, I'm Brendan. I'm the uh, CEO and co founder of OpenSignal. And I want to tell you a bit about what we do at OpenSignal, but then I want to talk to you about what we see as the future of sensor networks. So at OpenSignal, we're using mobile phones as sensors to map out the world that we live in. We believe that mobile phones have so much more power than what we're currently using them for, and that they're your ticket to be part of a global mobile sensor network. And the power of that collective intelligence is phenomenal. So the first challenge we're looking at with mobile phones is mobile signal. It's the most basic feature on our phone. It's what allows us to stay connected. So we built an app that will measure, wherever a user goes, the signal connectivity they're getting and the performance of the network. And crowdsourced over all of our users, we're putting together a picture of wireless networks around the world. For users of the app, we do things like help you get a better signal in real time. If you're struggling to make a call or send an email, we'll show you where you can get a better signal right there and then. We'll also show you over time if another operator would be offering you a better signal based on your personalized history. And failing all that, we'll show you where you can get free Wi-Fi in any city in the world. So since launching, we've had about 6 million people download the app. And that means we've got a million active devices out there constantly probing the wireless network and sending us data back. We think this is just the beginning of what happens when mobile scale meets sensor networks. So with this data, we're trying to build up a definitive data source on wireless networks around the world. And we sell insights based on this data to anyone who wants to understand the, the wireless market that's out there today. So people like mobile operators, companies like Gartner, Deloitte, and Barclays Bank rely on our data to understand wireless markets. We also put out public reports. So last week, we took a look, based on our phones in the field, what is the actual quality of LTE networks that people are seeing out there? And we tried to cut through the marketing hype of these large download figures to figure out what kind of experience people are really getting. And there's no good having a fast download speed if you can't actually get an LTE signal. So we looked at places like South Korea and Sweden. You're seeing great coverage. You can get an LTE signal about 90% of the time. But if you take my home country, the UK, you can only really get an LTE signal about half the time. And as a consumer, that's something I'd really like to know. But we also look at speed of... OK, I've missed the slide. But let me skip on anyway. 
So what's next? Well, we think the power of crowdsourced mobile sensor networks extends far beyond just mobile signal and wireless networks. Take Waze, for example, a company that uses mobile phones to map out real-time traffic information, which of course led to their recent over a billion dollar exit by Google. So I just want to highlight three areas of sensor networks that I think is indicative of the future of where sensor networks are going. Oh, that was the slide I was missing. But I'm moving on anyway. So this shows as each new generation of phone comes out, additional sensors are always being added. And just the way when the GPS sensor was first put on a mobile device, that spawned a whole new wave of location-aware applications. And as each new sensor is added, a whole new generation of different applications are now available to be made. The Galaxy S5, this is showing the Galaxy S series of phones, and the Galaxy S5 just came out yesterday and added a fingerprint sensor, a heartbeat sensor, and, um, and a couple of other sensors as well. It's continually increasing, so it's always opening up new possibilities. These sensors are also being used to make these devices smarter about the environment that they're in. We can use the GPS and the gyroscope to understand, are you currently in a car? Are you walking? Are you cycling? We can know a lot more about what a user is actually doing, and this means we can make smarter applications. We can really understand the context that a user is in. Think about the difference between knowing the coordinate of a user. They could be in Las Ramblas in central Barcelona, and that's all you know. Or if you know what they're doing, you could know if they're waiting for a taxi, they're late for a meeting, they're shopping, they're sitting there at, they're at a restaurant, they're having a lunch. With all these things, you can make much smarter applications if you know what a user is doing. Apple also just added a new coprocessor to its latest iPhone. This is a secondary chip that can be always on. It's a low-powered chip that can listen to this sensory input and constantly record it. Now, what does that mean? That simply means that battery is still at a premium on mobile devices. You can't constantly listen to the sensors, but with a low-powered secondary chip, you can, and you can batch that data together, and ultimately, the data volumes you can achieve are much increased. So at OpenSignal, we spent time thinking about these different changes and evolutions in the industry and what we could do with them. And you might have noticed on the Galaxy S4, some of the sensors that are being added are thermometers, barometers, and humidity sensors. And we looked at those and thought, well, that kind of sounds like a weather station. Maybe we could build an app which would listen to these sensory inputs and crowdsourced over all the users of the app could maybe build a data set that could be used to make better, better weather predictions one day. So we did this and called it Weather Signal. Not very original, uh, but we've managed to build up around 50,000 active users of this device in just a few months. So it's not exactly the same as weather stations, but when mobile scale really comes into play, this could go up an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, and the possibilities would get really interesting. Now, you may be skeptical and say, well, this isn't quite the same as a controlled, a controlled weather station. Your phone could be indoors, it could be outdoors, it could be in your pocket, it could be hot because you've been playing too much Flappy Bird. I don't know. There are a lot of other factors that impact the temperature of your phone. So we ran an experiment. And we looked at the temperatures we were getting back from our users and an external source of environmental temperatures. And although individually the data can be unreliable, when crowdsourced over enough people, those differences can average out. And we saw a very good correlation in the data. You can see our data in blue and the ambient environmental temperature in red. And it's, you can take the signal from the noise. So at OpenSignal, we think that the fact that everyone is now carrying around a device that is your ticket to be part of a global mobile sensor network is a revolution. And we're trying to build the technology to take advantage of this. Right now, we're doing it for Signal. Maybe next, it's for the weather. But in the future, we think almost every industry is going to be affected by this. So my question for you today is if you know that mobile phones can make the world your lab, what experiment would you like to run? Thanks a lot for listening.
And so just to introduce the next uh, Qualcomm Ventures portfolio company, this is Matterport with a fascinating bit of technology. Here you go. Hi, I'm Matt Bell, founder and chief strategy officer at Matterport. We are a 3D computer vision technology company based in Mountain View, California, with a system that allows you to capture the world around you in 3D and share it online, on the web, and on mobile. Now, I want you to think about your smartphone today. Think about the last time you looked at a gallery of images. Now, images are great. They're windows into the world. But the trouble is, you're stuck on the outside of that window. You're stuck in 2D. Now, this last image is different. It's actually a Matterport 3D model. With Matterport, you can capture a room like this in just a few minutes and then wander through it freely in the same way that you would with any sort of interactive 3D video game. In fact, this room uh, can be browsed on the Matterport website along with a wide variety of other locations. You can even go like jump on the counters if you want and go hog wild. Um, in the past, to capture a space like this, would have taken a 3D artist several days, not to mention a great deal of talent. And now, just like from painting photo to photography, you can create this in just a few minutes using the Matterport camera. Here's something you really can't do in 2D, just popping out and viewing the entire location all at once. So 3D is the new media. We've gone from photographs, to videos, to panoramas, to full immersive 3D models. But they aren't just pretty pictures. They contain underlying structural and dimensional data that allows them to be manipulated and analyzed in very interesting ways. Here we've peeled back the onion and you're seeing the inside, the triangles, the mesh that make up this Matterport model. Now you can use this to get accurate measurements and make annotations but you can also do something even more interesting. Let's do a virtual remodel of this space. So this, this office carpet is kind of bland. What if we went with like a more dark, serious carpet? There we go. So I like the dark gray, but the pattern is kind of distracting. So let's, let's try a more subtle pattern with that gray. All right, so that looks pretty good. Let's turn our attention to the lobby. Now, we want guests to feel welcome as they come to visit the site. So let's try brightening up the wall a bit. You know, the white wall's everywhere. That's kind of bland. What would an orange wall look like? Well, let's see. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. So visitors need a place to sit as well. So let's pr pull up a catalog of 3D models of furniture and start to drag and drop furniture into the space. Now, what we're doing here is we're able to visualize a very expensive remodeling and furniture purchase decision and walk through the space getting a sense for exactly what we would get with different configurations. Now, we're remodeling an office here, but you could imagine doing the same thing with a museum, a retailer, an art gallery, or even your own home. The possibilities here are endless. Now, just a couple of years ago, if you wanted to make a 3D model like this and you weren't a 3D artist, it was very difficult. First, you needed a laser scanner, which cost $50,000 and up, you needed to know how to use it, took a full day on site to scan, plus several days of post-processing using expensive workstation software. Really, it was anything but mobile. It couldn't be shared online, and it definitely wasn't for everyone. Today, Matterport provides a low-cost, professional-grade 3D camera that allows you to capture the world around you in 3D and share it online, on web and on mobile. Now, this is a model of the Four Seasons Presidential Suite in Palo Alto, California. It's a very rare and exclusive location, but now everyone can experience it online via Matterport. Now, in the near future, by combining powerful GPUs, mobile 3D sensors, and Matterport software, 
we are going to be able to bring about the era of mobile 3D capture with millions of people able to take the phones in their pockets and capture the world around them into, in 3D, leading to a tidal wave of new use cases and applications, including shopping for furniture or any other physical goods for that matter, social sharing of 3D spaces, a la Instagram, and high-quality, true augmented reality gaming. So Matterport is pioneering a mobile embedded 3D future by creating the software necessary to allow the device in your pocket with a built-in 3D sensor to capture and share the world in 3D. The pace of innovation that Qualcomm delivers is fast and exciting creating a path that allows use cases like ours to move from the professional world to the consumer world and be shared by millions of people. The future of mobile media is 3D. I invite you all to come check out Matterport. We will be in Qualcomm's booth tomorrow. In fact, let me show you the booth. We arrived on Sunday and as they were madly trying to finish the setup of the booth, we ran around and captured the booth in 3D. Oh. I believe we're waiting for them to switch over the source. Oh, all right, you're all seeing, and I'm the only one who's not. So, uh, so yeah, you're getting a virtual 3D tour of this booth. Uh, there is still a few details on the floor that uh, that were during the setup phase, but you can now experience the booth in person and online and see that the two match up. That station right there is actually where you can find us. Thank you very much. I'll be over there in the corner if you have any questions afterwards. And thank you, Anand, for having us. There you go. Thanks. Nobody's telling me. Can, can you turn this back on? I'll just talk without it. All right. Uh, so as you can see, two very exciting companies, OpenSignal, uh, taking advantage of crowdsourcing to get, uh, give, provide you insights about signal strength on a global basis. And clearly, uh, Brendan and team have ambitions to Sorry, go sir. well beyond that in terms of providing insights about other things as well, uh, maybe the uh, well-being and happiness index of people around the globe and uh, political parties and so on and so forth. Who knows? But I can't wait to see what exciting futures they come up with. And you saw an exciting uh, vision of what Matt and company are doing. But what's common with both of these companies is uh, uh, they're unleashing and putting it in the hands of all of us, everyday people, uh, the power of mobile technology. So using their applications, you can take it to the next step. You also have the opportunity to do this. And I invite those of you are the, are the entrepreneurs and innovators to participate in Qualcomm's Q Prize 2014. Uh, we're accepting applications now. You can go to our website, qprize.com. We run this contest every year. We have seven regional winners on a global basis. We take applications from China, Europe, India, Israel, Korea, Latin America, and North America. Uh, regional winners get about $100,000 uh, from Qualcomm, and the, uh, uh, each uh, and the additional, uh, with an additional $150,000 for a grand prize. Uh, these, uh, the benefit of doing this is certainly you get to know Qualcomm, but we also have uh, professional venture capitalists that participate with us in terms of the selection process. So your ideas get exposed not only to us, but also to uh, professional VCs. And for early stage companies, it's a great way to do it. So with that, really appreciate and am honored that uh, we got some time uh, to talk about, um, uh, to you guys about our vision and present to you two of our portfolio companies. And thank you very much for your time.